If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this coming up episode of Mind Pump for 23 minutes... Doug forgot to take the notes. Yeah, we, we, but we remember uh, Adam, Justin, and myself had some fun conversation. For the first 23 minutes, we talked about attractiveness. We talked about how men and women were just animals. Uh, we talked about feet. I think we talked about your feet. We Adam. did. We talked about we talked about feet. We talked also about uh, sales, too. Sales and yeah. how uh, women can crush it in sales because right. they have some inherent... Uh, advantages. We also mentioned Organifi in this episode. Adam is actually putting together some delicious recipes that he is not sharing with anybody but himself. <laughs> That's uh, not true. If you guys follow me on my Instagram, you'll, on my Insta stories, I'll be posting them up there. Oh, he'll share the recipe, but not the actual product. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you can go to OrganifiShop.com, enter the code MINDPUMP, and get a massive <sighs> discount. Then we get into the questions. The first question was, why does the body even want to become efficient and adapt? If it is for survival, then why live longer? What is the goal of living longer? Why does the body want to do that? The answers may sound obvious to you, but we actually go much deeper in this episode. You'll have to listen to find out. The next question was, what are our thoughts on using a belt to keep your waist small? A weight belt, for example. You have a lot of bodybuilders go in the gym and wear a weight belt the entire workout. Uh, They also wonder, is that doing some kind of you know, blood flow restriction or occlusion training, won't that just do the opposite? Uh, Good discussion there. Then we get into the question, why do female CrossFit athletes have a thick waist? Does CrossFit ruin a female physique? As uh, horrible as that question sounds, you may be surprised at the answer. Look out. The last question is, in the new nutrition guide, we talk about calorie undulation and its benefits for weight loss. Are there benefits for undulating your calories when you're trying to pack on the mass. You may be surprised at the answer. Also, we have a lot of new listeners uh, coming on to Mind Pump. We've been on a few podcasts. If you're interested in what we talk about, if you want expert exercise programming, if you're very serious about getting in shape, if you want to build muscle, burn body fat, you want to move better, feel better, without having to spend hours and hours in the gym, The thing that we suggest you enroll in is our MAPS Super Bundle. The Super Bundle is literally almost an entire year worth of exercise programming. So that basically means that your whole year is planned out for you. That means you know what to do for the first three weeks, for the second three weeks, for the following four weeks, and so on. You go to the gym, you follow the program, just do what we tell you to do in the program. Learn about your body the entire time. At the end of that year... You are a much better, stronger, leaner version of yourself. For more information on the MAP Super Bundle, just go to mindpumpmedia.com. You don't have that bad looking feet. No, they're not bad. It's okay. They look better when they're French tip. You would, you would interweave with them, wouldn't you? No. He's got long toes like me. If so you had to pick be, one guy. To be able to, yeah. One guy. You got to interweave. If I had to pick. Like interweave. <laughs> interweave the toes. Like, it, that's like the <laughs> most intimate thing I've ever heard of. I almost feel like. I'd rather touch tips than I know. That. I almost. <laughs> <laughs> like, can you imagine? Like, ah. You know what I'm saying? That's kind of. That's like, like five minutes. It's like, like five minutes. I the worst even, five minutes of your life. I wouldn't even do that to someone I was attracted to. It's gross. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they have the toes locked up. No, I know. It's 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 just weird. It's just a horrible thought I had. Yeah. You guys ever you guys you guys ever get into the toe sucking thing? No. no. Me I neither. I never oh. like There's it. some dudes that are so into yeah. toes. I had I you know, I had a couple of girls try it's it. Nasty. Like, nah, it's not my thing. It's just like the the anal thing. I'm just never mm. don't stick any fingers in my butt. I'm not into Oh, anal. your butt. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah don't, don't, that, for an invader. I'm not a, I'm not big. Don't suck my toes. That doesn't turn me on. No, not your toes. Yeah, don't twist my nipples. Oh, stop. Oh, somebody <laughs> sucked your toes? I'm saying yeah, that's oh. fucking yeah. gross, dude. No, don't I take ever. care of my I, feet, bro. I meant some oh. guys are into sucking girls' toes, not you getting your toes sucked. <laughs> that's weird. You've had girls yeah. try to suck on your toes? Yeah. Oh. Wait, wait, wait. You've had 
I, got, I had good looking feet, bro. When, <laughs> when they were all when they were all manicured like, like, up, tickled. and you got the French yeah. tip on them, and stuff like, like yeah. that. What it, kind of girl wants to suck on a man's toes? You got good looking man. feet, man. That's, What's up? That's that's a that's a girl. That's weird. That's an yeah. Interesting girl. <laughs> but you've never been. I think it's just as weird when they want to stick your finger in your butt too. Yeah, but you never you've never wanted to. That's the thing. So, but but it's much more popular or common. It's more popular for a man to want to suck on a girl's toes. Maybe in your world you've had a lot of fingers up your butt, but I. Yeah, I don't know. It's circuit you no. travel in there. Yeah, I know. No, one at a yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. There's a <laughs> lot of. There's a lot of. There's a. There's like a thing where men like women's feet and want to like. Yeah, I know. It's a suckle fetish. them. It's, that's what I was talking about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I like. I like women's feet. Like I. I think that's. Uh, and I've. I've been with girls that have ugly feet. I mean, it's, it's cuter a turn than off. guys. Like it's yeah, it's yeah, a turn off when you have ugly feet. Just, it's. Uh, it's more like feet to me are like a hygiene thing. So it's like that's like. Skin, hair, feet, nails, those all kind of go in the same category as me as far as like they're not they're not turn ons as much as they could be turn offs if you don't take care of them. Yeah. Mm. So it's like I I don't you don't have to have like the most perfect skin for me to really like it, but if you don't take care of your skin, like that bothers me. If you don't you don't have the most perfect feet, but if you don't take care of your feet, then that then that's mm. gross, right? It's kinda of like that for me. It's like mm. I'm not yeah. the irony of it of is turn me way. The on. irony of it is that our feet are always covered. It's like way more clean than your hands. You yeah. know what I'm saying? But you'll like hold a girl's oh, hand. No, it's and... pretty swampy down there. Yeah, yeah. Sweaty you know I mean? feet, bro. Socks on. Oh, yeah. Get layers. Yeah, it can be. Ugh. It can be. No, I don't think so. Imagine like a Ben Greenfield's feet. Oh, dude. He looks like a hobbit. Yeah. Mm. His feet look functional, which is not necessarily good looking. It just means that they work <laughs> anywhere. They're, remember, they're strong. Remember when we first met him? He saw him and it's like, those two things that stood out when I saw feet him. Feet right away. Yeah, I was like, yeah. whoa, you don't, like you're- yeah, like, you got hooves. <laughs> You're chimpish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In Chimp. real world, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you can. No, his. Like I feel like uh, if yeah, he, you could totally hang upside down. Yeah, I feel like if he like he, his hands don't match his body, like his hands belong. Oh, on. they look like they're a three hundred pound man. <laughs> no, they do. Yeah. If you've ever shook the like hand, he's got if you ever shook the hand of a six foot seven, three hundred pound guy, yeah, like that that hand. That's how <laughs> Ben Greenfield's hand feels on his wiry frame. Mm. It just doesn't match. It doesn't match. So it's really fascinating. His feet are the same way too. His feet look like three hundred pound man's big ass feet too. They're like Hobbit. Like if you yeah. watch Lord of the Rings and you see their feet yeah. with the hair on the top and mm -hmm. they're fucking like you can. Uh, it's a good he, look. Like you can operate utensils with them. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> How and, much could I pay you to like let them feed you something? <laughs> 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 With his foot, that'd be the most what were you guys, amazing video. What were you guys talking to Drew when I brought breakfast? You guys were getting all into him right now. Oh you? no, we were joking with with Drew. We were asking him about sex questions, how many girls he's been with, oh, and this yeah. and the other. Yeah. And he's a nineteen. I'm not gonna put him on blast. Don't put him on blast. No. Oh. But he's a kid, right? He's only nineteen yeah. years old. And you know, when you're a nineteen year old guy and your buddies, especially if there's dudes that you look up to, ask you questions like that, you're gonna. You're, You're gonna, gonna inflate, inflate shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, so he was definitely inflation. He's in there. totally doing that, there's, there's, and, he, and he thinks we don't know. And I'm like, come on, dude. I, there's, man. there's for sure. There's an actual true. mathematical equation for this. Divided by three? It, no, divide by three. Is, yeah, divide by three. If it's a guy saying it, if it's a girl saying it, you multiply, multiply by, by three. three. Yeah, 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 that's the that's the equation for it. girls mm. will always lie. Like, oh, it's only been two. Okay, yeah. six, bitch. Come yeah. on. <laughs> it's, it's, six. Yeah, we already know. We know that for sure. Yeah. And if it's a guy, like, oh yeah, it's like fifteen. Like, okay, probably five. Yeah, let's be honest. Lake Havasu did. Happen? Yeah. <laughs> no, is that does are it we count? Counting days? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Does it count like, if they're all at the same time? Yeah. Or is that what if you once? went back to the other? You know, like your first one. Yeah. <clears throat> Isn't that funny that we live in a society that's like that? Like, why is it any that we care about that? Right. Yeah, that it, that one that cares? we care about that two that it's different for a man or a woman. It's kind of unfair. It's not. I think. I think it's because it men it's judge standard. Men judge each other on a few different things. One thing we judge each other is on a, how much money we earn. Earning potential, your sexual proclivity. <laughs> Our, yeah, yeah, your your sexual prowess, right? Like yeah. if you can, if women are really like attracted to bragging you, bragging rights. That means you're like a like a god. You're you know you got a high status, right? Yeah. And then the other one is like physical, like how physically strong you are, physically dominant you are. Those are the three big ones I think men tend to kind of judge each other on. I guess not necessarily in a bad way, but why do definitely you think that is though? Yeah. Why do I? It's why it's why, always been primal, that way. dude? Yeah. yeah I know. Primal. I know it is primal. But why? Why? What? What's so advantageous about me knowing? Like, if I meet you, is it because? Is it like a hunt and kill thing? It's like mm. I meet you. I meet Sal. Right. We're thousands of years before, and like I want to know. Dude, we're still animals. You know what I mean? Like we forget that we're animals. I want to know how many women you slept with because to me that means you're a better hunter than maybe Justin. It means if I'm a if I have a lot of women that I'm sleeping with, and it's you know thousands of years ago, and we're hunter gatherers. It means that I probably have the resources to 
take care of and these the, you know these 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 children that I'm fathering and that these women are attracted to me because I have the resources in my well, power. Well, that makes a lot of stuff. sense because that's it's a lot like that today. Yeah. Yeah. Think about that. We it, you people give like some women that are what they, you know, quote unquote, I'm using the air quotes here with the gold diggers, right? Mm-hmm. That come after guys that have tons of money and stuff but it really makes sense why that's just a natural of thing course. for them to do because he's got all the resources of course right? of mm. course it's funny that we get mad at that like we get mad like oh she's just after me for my money and then they can throw it right back to us and be like well you're just after her because she's hot yeah and it's like well they're both primitive like, hmm. instincts you know what i mean yeah. they're both primitive right. desires right because she if she's that hot that's normally because lot. she's probably fertile yeah right I mean, she can she can father my child or whatever you know what I mean? And it propagates the species. You're right. We're animals, Justin. That's what I'm saying. It's just we we want to like we pretend forget. Like we're not. Yeah, we want to like create this whole <laughs> facade that we're so you know above all that you know nature and everything else. And it's like, uh, no, you still have sex. <laughs> well, you know what's funny about that is there's a few things that are that men and women both find attractive in each other, but then there's things that are not that we don't rank the same, like sense of humor. Men, if they list the top five things that they find in a woman attractive, that they're really attracted to, sense of humor usually doesn't crack the top five. Always does for women. For women, it's always. it's almost always. So no, it's actually five. a lot what of times one. Yeah. It's actually one. It's status. Like- it's status. Okay. It's status. If you're, if you're charming and funny and whatever, it meant you probably held a higher position in society, which meant you probably were is able to find more resources. Is that a confidence thing or is it it's just an the, intellect thing? I think yeah. it's more of an intellect thing. Then. Yeah. You, yeah. Like typically, if, you if, have if, to be smart. If you, yeah. If you're, if, you're, if you're funny, right, more than likely you're witty and you're smarter. So I would think it mm. lines more with that, right? And that would go back to being- It's funny because they've, done, they've actually done studies on this <clears throat> and men- tend to rank higher than women in terms of, I don't know how they test this, by the way, so let's take this with a grain of salt, but men typically have a, a better or sharper sense of humor. But the the studies conclude it's not because we're genetically better at it. It's because we understand at an early age that girls value that, so we right. work on it. Because uh, I remember as a boy... Especially when you're young. Oh, I before you. Like, I have being vivid, funny was how vi- you got their attention. Yes. I have vivid memories, yes. and you guys have talked on this That's podcast before. Like I think MO. you just recently talked about, uh, you know, or where who we were with, who we just interviewed. It was Josh Trent interviewed us. That interview, he talked about, uh, you know, watching my ability with a, a group of people I've never met before, and that w- that was actually a trained skill that I remember being a kid coming to school not knowing people. Yeah. And it was like I could either choose to be jumping around like yeah. different schools. So I remember like having to like butt myself into conversations, and it, you easily could have just sat there, kept your mouth shut, never get noticed, yeah. and just be that guy. Or but then you get picked on more, right? right? If I interject my if I interject myself, I say something funny, I grab the attention of everybody, and more often that means the women or the girls that are paying attention or listening to us that laugh and giggle and pay attention because that's one way right away to get street cred with a young boy. All the other young boys is I say something funny. Doesn't matter if it's funny to you guys. No, if, if the, the girls, girls laugh, if the girls laugh, yeah, you're. You're killing. Right, yeah. exactly. Like, I'm on to something. That's and, how you get your stats. And so, that's so funny. That's subconscious, so subconsciously. Uh, the, uh, yeah, no, subconsciously <laughs> as a kid, I 100% was putting that together. Every guy knows that. Yeah. Right. Every yeah. guy knows that, whether you're good at it or not. Every guy knows if I can be funny, then I'm going to get attention from women. Mm-hmm. 100%. It mm-hmm. is not the other way around no. for girls. Like, if they're funny, it's great. It's a plus. I actually really enjoy <laughs> yeah. it. Like but it's favorite. not like this big thing that stands out to me. You know Do you know that Jordan Art of Charm? They they teach this right. So they mm. teach they teach like uh, having this like opener joke and everything is like your first introduction to people. Yeah. For that. So t- the icebreaker. So take it a step further, girl. When they've done studies on this, I love this subject by the way. When they've done studies on this, they'll find that girls will instinctively laugh more to attract a guy. Oh. So if she's attracted to a guy or like louder. It's yeah, if she's Which attracted, is why you always, it's always a dead giveaway when a girl likes a guy when a guy says something stupid and, yeah, and, 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 like, and the girl still starts like, snorting. It's like, you know, like <laughs> and even so <laughs> like, to take that to take that a step further, this is how I could always tell too <laughs> with, if another girl thought I was it was into me was cuz I know what's funny when I say you make a stupid yeah. joke. Yeah, when I say a stupid <laughs> joke and I get her laughing I'm like, her laughing. Oh, it's like oh, game, it's, game yeah. over right okay, there. I got you. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I got you. Yeah, it's yeah. already that was a terrible one. You know it's another giveaway that <laughs> uh, I read about Throw was a dad um, joke in there. <laughs> uh, what's it called like is it preening when you're like fixing your hair or oh yeah, I start twirling like yeah like yeah. like when it was so this is you you know they talk about this all the time it's this these are fascinating studies I know, it's interesting I, if a woman's attracted to a man 
subconsciously she'll play with her hair or adjust herself as if she's trying to like, without knowing, trying to make herself look more attractive. Yeah. So if a girl starts touching herself, playing with her, playing with her hair mm. while she's talking to you, that's a sign. It doesn't guarantee it. All right, guys. <laughs> it's not a for sure. You, you, you got to be careful. Uh, I to this. Because yeah. on the other side yeah. of that, on the on the flip side of it, men are almost always likely to think, or more likely to think, a girl's into them. So we will always assume. A girl likes us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Overly yeah. confident. Overly, because yeah, you have to be because you get <laughs> shut down so often. Which is so true. Yeah. Whenever you're, whenever you're with your buddies, and you know what I mean. Well, they have. So, oh, she totally t- like me. Yeah, oh yeah. They they talk about this with sales, right? This she is why me. men tend to be better in sales. It's not because genetically we better we're better. It's that we're used to being told no our whole life <laughs> and overcoming, overcoming yes, <laughs> yes and and taking rejection. It's not a big deal. It's uh, like you know, like uh, I've been told this. That's the funniest thing I've ever heard. It's so yeah. true though. It's like you've been told no so many times your whole life it's like it's and so it's a natural sales becomes more natural for me it's why men dominate sales it really is be- not because we're technically better we need to look up that statistic because i could have oh i've read it before yeah. did you because yeah. i could have yeah. swore very, very confirm that i could have swore that some of the that that women do better so here's here's there's the, more men in sales so but- yes so here's the continuation of that so there's there's more of us now a woman who harnesses those skills will be better because of her empathy because if she actually can take those skill, same skill sets, communicate so much yes, better, connect yes. on another level. Because right, women, yes. women typically I've seen are, that a lot, actually. yeah. Because women typically rank better in communication. The good sales I've women I've met are like dude, amazing. Like they, they get are. inside the head of the That's person. It, I, killers. I remember training trainers and training sales, and I would always say that I'd say, man, if I if I can get a girl that is has my skill sets, she'll be ten times better than I ever was because you have this ability. They, People are women. Just have this empathy about them that uh, men just can't tap into it on the same level. Sure, we practice it. Sure, I try it. And, I and there's do. individual, yeah. you know, of course, right? of course. Yeah. We're talking about obviously yeah. everything General. we're saying is an overgeneralization right now. Generic. But it, it, as in collectively as a whole of all the people that you know I've coached and trained in, in sales, yeah, uh, men well, men do you- dominate the amount. But with the women that actually put it all together end up being way more lethal. Have you ever been like have you ever met a saleswoman who sold you something and then just afterwards been like, what? Cuz I I always appreciate good salespeople. I two come to mind right away. Uh, Melissa Fong and Monique Varela. Yeah. Those two girls Fong. Both those girls worked for me. Both those I used to call mini me's. Like I and it was I had tons of women and you introduced I'm, her to Speed Stack as well. I remember I that day. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, <laughs> like going around the entire club closing. How big was she? You gave her a whole Speed Stack? Yeah, like she's yeah. a little 112 pound Asian I girl. Like, oh no! Oh I was like, oh no! You got your Speed Stack too? Oh, uh, here she, we go. She was a killer. Her and Monique both. Uh, they it, they just got it. Like they got it. They weren't afraid of the nose. They were both girls who had overcame kind of super adversity, smart. adversity yeah. and teasing early on. Both very super smart. Got on to get their masters. Competitive sides to them. That one was a tennis player. The other one was a boxer. So both had athletic sides to them. So they had the perfect formula of, of like a been through struggles, been told no as a woman plenty of times, just like a lot of men have dealt with. Really intelligent, pushed through school. Both had competitive personalities. And that mix with me teaching them like sales and fitness, oh, they were just unbre- yeah. unbelievable. I also think yeah, sometimes killers. there's a there's an advantage to being in a field that's dominated by the opposite sex, but being good yeah. at it. So yeah. I'll give you an example. Like if you're if you're a man and you're a teacher, which is dominated by women, but you're a good teacher, it, you probably have an advantage because you stand out, you stand out, absolutely. Right? And then the vi- and then vice versa. If you're a woman and you're in a male dominated field, but you're good. You stand out even more. Oh, it's mm-hmm. like we talk about this in sports all the time. Whenever you see the anomaly, we were just talking about this on the show the other day about the Spud Webs and stuff like that. Those those names go forever remembered. Now Spud Webb didn't break any real serious major records. But he's about five seven. Yeah, but exactly because of how small he is, and in a, in a league that you you just stand out like big time. So I used to train. Uh, I trained a, a surgeon. Um, she's a general surgeon, but she also did vascular surgery and all kinds of stuff. And she was like whenever I'd bring her name, because I trained a lot of surgeons. And w- and one thing about surgeons, and I'm going to be an overgeneralization here, is that uh, they all, they tend to have the stereotype of being like this God complex. Like, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm like, whatever, like I can't do no wrong. And when I'd bring up other surgeons' names to these surgeons, they wouldn't usually comment too much. It wasn't like they were like, oh, he's a per- great guy, great, you know, it's almost competitive. And they never really said anything bad or anything. But when I brought her name up, Every single, because the rest of my surgeon clients were were men, every single one of them was like, 
oh, she's a badass. She's aw- she's like one of the best surgeons you'll ever find. She's awesome. And she was totally in the male dominated field. So she had, and she came up, you know, you're talking about in the 70s and 80s. Well, you got to think that. 90s when it was very male dominated. I think part of, the, part of that she is, killed it. is yeah. they're, because they're facing adversity like that, it causes them to have to rise even more, right? So it's, you can't, you, if you're in a male dominated sales field and you do well, to be in the upper ten percent or what like that, like you're, that's the. Goal. I think there's certain sales jobs that are dominated by females. I think real estate might be one of them, if I'm not mistaken. But real estate is one. I think, yeah, I think there's more women yeah. that sell yeah. real estate than men do. There, definitely, as a whole, though, it's not. I mean, men, there's yeah, because if you can't all the sales, jobs, yeah, right? yeah, it's still way dominated by by men. And like I said, when you see when you actually meet a woman that actually puts all that together really well, it's extremely impressive. And I think she can she can sell better than a man because she has that empathy side that's built into her. That's because here's the thing: what they say, women, what the empathy side, the men, the logical side. And I know I'm being fucking totally yeah, sure. and, and fucking there's some <laughs> somebody who's saying that. Sure. Prehistoric. Yeah, whatever. There's exceptions yeah. to the rule. Everything. Fuck off. Right. So, these are the, the those those two. You're not things. being very empathetic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Typical male. <laughs> I understand. Yeah. <clears throat> it's true. Though. Crying. And but uh, logical thinking doesn't really isn't that uh, important in sales, right? It's not not that it, you can't use it, and logic doesn't help. It's not you're not gonna, you're not going to sell something with logic. Exactly. It just doesn't. Yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't. People no, buy things no. with emotion. No, right? exactly. That's 100%. why empathy is such a, a more of a so, powerful you know, tool. So, so yeah. let me ask you this, Adam, yeah. because you're I, you know I consider you a decent salesperson. <laughs> 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 it's not bad. Have you? Have you? Remember Justin? Said I wish I would have never said. I know. You see what you again. did, bro? Oh, you see no, what you did? I'm joking. We'll ask Larry and, oh, and uh, yeah. too much oh, air. Oh, we're gonna get into this. I popped too much air in there. I can't wait to do that. Yeah. No, but all joking aside, have you ever taken these personality tests that will that will rank uh, or like uh, tell you the type of intelligence you have, like? And it'll classify it as male or female. Have you ever done anything like that? I have. Emotional Intelligence 2.0 has a test inside the book that I, I have. Did you test more female than male? You know what? Um, that's a good question. I don't remember. I do not I do know that I have tons of feminine traits for sure. 100%. I mean, think about it. I was uh, raised by my mom. I was raised yeah. by my mom. I had women around me. All, the cousins that I did see were all women. Like So... Uh, I mean, I could braid hair. I can do things that most guys couldn't do because mm-hmm. I was I was put. So there's disadvantages of that, and then there's advantages, and it helped me in sales because I'm I think I'm a very empathetic person. Because there's certain there's certain tests that, and I don't know if they're outdated, but back when I did them, there's one where it's just you have pictures of eyes, so you don't see the rest of the face, you don't see anything below the eyes or anything above the eyes. All you see is eyes, and then you have to guess what emotion they're expressing. So like I anger, that, sadness, yeah. excitement, whatever, just on the eyes. Men typically do horribly at that test and women yes. typically do well yeah. at that test. And and that's like one of the, there's a, there's a couple other tests, but that's one of the ones where they say they can determine pretty accurately more than other tests, I should say, if, if you're a man or a woman. I fucking tested woman on that. Like I, I remember I took that test. It's when I did the short stint at, uh, when I worked for Bank of America, they did these, these personality type tests on us and they're like, Oh, you have a lot of female type intelligence. Yeah. You know, that's, I mean, to me, that's social awareness. Right. So I, and I think you guys all have that really well. And it's, to me, it's very obvious when I meet somebody who doesn't have social awareness. Hmm. Um, and that's just that ability to, to be in a room with different types of personalities and likes and needs and, and conversations happening. Do you know anybody like that? That's like totally just Oh. Fucking clueless. Oh, like, dude, why, why are we, they so we, upset? Uh, we were, like, you yeah. totally offended them. I we're, did. We're, yeah. we're around mm-hmm. it all the time. My, one of my biggest pet peeves that we have, or that I have, and 100% I know this is my own ego and insecurities that drives this pet peeve, is like when we get people uh, in our space that do what we do, that spend more time telling us and giving us advice than actually asking questions. It, it annoys me and inside. I don't show that. They don't know that. you know. But inside, I'm like, you idiot. Yeah. Like you're in the same space as I am. You want to do what I'm doing. Meanwhile, you're you have a little window where we're conversing, and you chose to spend that time telling me how I should do things, yeah, or, or like just boasting like, about what they're doing. Right? Like, yeah. like how how what an idiot you are. Like, and we've we've definitely had people before that's come in this facility that we've brought under our wing or spent time with and have been around us before, and instead of 
taking advantage of that and asking questions. And of course, the part that makes it like a pet peeve is my own insecurities of feeling like, oh, oh, they don't think they don't recognize. Yeah, they don't, being, rec- yeah, they, they don't see my they value. Don't, yeah, they don't recognize yeah. how smart or how valuable we put, potentially can be. So that's my own issue, right? Which that's why I don't express it or say anything. In the past, yeah. I would say some shit. In the past, I'd be like, you're an idiot. <laughs> like, yeah. you, really? You just you decided you're still talking about yourself? Yeah, yeah you're still yeah. down about that. You want to do what I'm doing, and you haven't you haven't asked any questions. Like so. No, we get that a lot, man. We've yeah, had yeah. we've had people. No, it's funny because like uh, like my grandfather's like that. Like he'll just without realizing just defend the fuck out of people, <laughs> and everybody's used, like everybody's they knows. I you thought know what that mean? was like an old trait though. At some point, you like lose fucks. No, I think he's always been that way. He's always been that yeah, way. Yeah, it's a and little it's bit just, of both, right? He just yeah. he just he just doesn't realize it. He's just gonna say some shit to annoy the you That's know true. to and just offend the fuck <laughs> the fuck yeah. out of you. And uh, it's it's funny. So my when my cousin got married. When he first got remarried, he lived with my grandparents as him and his wife at the time were saving money to buy a house because they lived up in here in San Jose. So they were living with my grandparents and my grand. So now she had to live with my grandfather. And my gra- he's a great guy. He's a <coughs> loving man. He's the first of our family to come to this country. He set everybody up through his hard work. So he's everybody just a macho, him. macho dude. He's just, he's just, sometimes he says shit, you know, and yeah. you get it. And he's like, what? I don't know. Why are you so upset? So they were, they made dinner and. She gets uh, she gets skin reactions if she eats gluten. So she and of course pasta bread, right? It's a big Italian thing. So she goes, uh, you know, they, he made they made dinner and, and you know she's like, oh, you know, I can't really eat you know gluten because it it bothers my skin, this and that. And he goes, oh, he goes, okay. He goes, you know, you know, uh, when I when I was in Sicily, he goes, uh, if I had a horse that couldn't eat something, we kill it. <laughs> and she's like, what? She's like, oh, I love this. Remember, guy. this she never really like knew him. You know what I mean? Oh, dude, so good. She's like, we kill it. And it's she's like, what do you so mean? Good. She's like, it's a bad horse. If it can't eat all the food, it's a bad horse. <laughs> it's an inside joke now. Now when we see each other, she says she's a bad horse. Oh my you know? god! But my cousin was like trying to tell her, like, no, 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 don't take offense. Don't he's take just, it. yeah, yeah he's, he's not, just, he's not trying to offend you. He's, he's kind of jabbing he's not gonna at you ki- in a funny way. Yeah, he's not going to, yeah. he's not going to kill you. That's no, yeah, that is, that is early though. Throw that out there, Doug. Bring on the offensive bird. being brought to you by Chimera Coffee. It's the only coffee that is infused with all natural nootropics for a cleaner, calmer, and more focused buzz without the crash. Click the Chimera link at mindpumpmedia.com and input the discount code MINDPUMP at checkout for 10% off. It's the motherfucking quad. The eagle has landed. All right, our first question is from NJH32. Why does the body want to become efficient and adapt? If you say it is to survive and live longer, why is the body's goal to live longer? So, a couple, couple things. So, first off, the why reason why the live? body... Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> why? We wouldn't yeah, be here yeah, if the yeah. body wanted to die. Yeah, that's a weird question. Uh, the body becomes efficient <laughs> because efficiency meant survival. So, in nature... If you had a very inefficient body, let's say your body was super inefficient with calories and you just burned, you know, 12,000 calories a day uh, because you had this inefficient, you know, uh, metabolism where you're, you're just burning a shit ton of calories. For most of the human civilization, you would not survive because you would not be around enough food to feed yourself that many calories. Another example would be if I just burn a ton of calories every single time I walk and my body never adapts and becomes more efficient at that, um, again, I will not be able to feed myself enough calories to make up for the amount of walking that I'm doing. So that being said, the second part of the question is, why does the body want to live longer? The real- Here's what's interesting. You will notice that most uh, chronic diseases, although we're seeing more and more now at younger ages, and that's just a result of our modern lifestyle. But for the most part, most diseases uh, that kill us, things like cancer, stuff like that, don't really appear until after around the age of 30. And the reason for that is we evolved out of that shit. The human body evolved to live long enough to procreate. And then after that, it doesn't matter if you die because now you've spread your seed. This is why you know cancer rates start to go up after 30 and then really start to spike after 50 and 60 and why it's very rare for a child to get cancer because the kids that got cancer during most of human civilization were not able to pass on those genetics. So 
The, re- the reality is your body evolved to survive long enough to procreate. Beyond that has to do with modern, our ability to nourish ourselves with right. enough take nutrients. Care of yourself, exercise. Take, yeah, take care of ourselves, all that stuff. Although there is some interesting stuff uh, within there, some interesting caveats. For example, men, if we're healthy and we take care of ourselves, theoretically, we can procreate until we die. So if you're a 70 year old man yeah. and you're really, really healthy, you're producing sperm. And theoretically, you can have and father a child. Now, this is not the case with women. Keep those hips healthy. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Damn. This is not the case with women. Women go through a period called menopause where the body stops being able to bear children. And there's some interesting speculation around that. One of them is uh, that if a woman was able to procreate at that age, the likelihood that she would survive is far, far lower because she's not as healthy and fit to do. Because let's be honest, childbirth is a is the most dangerous thing that a woman ever did for 99.9% of human civilization, by far. It killed more women. It actually killed more humans than anything besides starvation and, and, and uh, you know infection is childbirth. So the other thing is that uh, anthropologists believe that the role of the grandmother was imperative in ensuring the survival um, in the upbringing of offspring, that the grandmother needed to be a very, very, uh, needed to play an important role. And so it became beneficial for her to not be able to to bear children so that she's, her job now or her role in grandma. the tribe is to take care, help take care of children, raise children yeah. and, and take care of her, you know, kids who have kids and, and so on, so... Interesting. That interesting is in, stuff. Yeah. That is interesting. It's interesting to me too that uh, the, just the question in general, like uh, why do we want to survive? I think it's kind of obvious, right, that we'd want to live longer. I mean, that to, <laughs> to me, that's. I mean, that's also too, and quality, right, of of life. Why why we even do what we do? We've talked about this before, where you know, uh, just because we exercise, we do all those things, doesn't ensure that we're not going to get some disease or we're not going to die at 70 years old, but it's, it's about improving your life. Right. So I don't know. This is the, I, the whole com- question. It's like bit, the fuck out of me. I know. I was like, is this a, like a super esoteric, you know, like, like deep question of like, why, you know, like why, you know, why, why are we all trying to live, man? Yeah. You know, like, it's like, I don't know. Like it, <laughs> the, everybody's got to find purpose. Yeah. Uh, the, the only scientific, like the only, like the prevailing scientific explanation is just your body is trying to stay alive long enough to uh, propagate, to yeah. pass its genes. And those genes passed by you now carry your, some of your blueprint. So whatever you had or whatever caused you survive gets passed on. And that's kind of the crux behind evolution. So, at some point, it became uh, evolutionary, you know, evolutionarily advantageous for humans to be hairless. You know, we're one of the few animals, uh, or or at least primates, uh, or I think only primates, to have very little body hair, which is strange because that's not really an advantage if you're out in the sun all the time. You're gonna fucking, you know, you're gonna you're gonna burn yourself. But if you consider humans are so are the most social of, of all creatures, and that we probably lived in tight, you know, tribes and societies, it made sense to not have tons of body hair because body hair also increased your odds of having, you know, fleas and ticks and shit like that. And it's probably better not to have them because you didn't spread as much disease. Uh, It's also why we have head uh, hair on our heads because that's the part that gets the sun. So all the, and, and you know, the thing about this is it's all looking backwards. Whenever we're talking about uh, our body's ability to adapt and become efficient and evolve, it's a lot of it's a guessing game, and really, it's the best guess that wins. Because many times, it's totally. I mean, here's something you want to consider too. It's totally viable that it could have been just some fucking accident, like, mm. uh, you know, that most humans had, you know, orange skin, but then for some reason, the people with the orange skin got some disease and they just all they, died. They ate a carrot and exploded. Yeah, <laughs> they just all something. died or something. Yeah. So now, you know, that doesn't that doesn't exist anymore. So. Some of the that could also explain some of it as well, but it's all looking back. But yeah, as far as the body becoming efficient, um, whenever we talk about things like, you know, your metabolism slowing down, or you know, you need to change your exercise, or we say we think say things like you have a damaged metabolism. Really, it's your body's doing exactly what it's supposed to. 
it's just not uh it's not something that is desirable right. like it's not desirable it's not, it's not benefiting your goal not in modern life like is it is it is it desirable in modern lifestyle to have a super super efficient and slow metabolism no it's not because you have access to tons of food all the time all around you um you are not active nearly as much as we used to be so in modern lifestyles and modern societies having an extremely efficient metabolism or slow metabolism now becomes a detriment. Now you have a propensity for obesity and for other problems, and now it becomes beneficial to have a faster metabolism. Well, if we went back in time, you know, 50,000 years ago, the person who was really thrifty with their calories, well, when a famine comes along, you know, you're going to do okay. You know, you put a bunch of fitness fanatics, you know, who are lots of muscle and super lean and you put a bunch of like obese people on an island with no food, uh, you know. Besides the fact that the fit people can probably hunt and stuff like that, but if you just left them there and said, "Okay, let's you can live the longest," yeah, with nothing, the obese people are gonna, <laughs> yeah, they're gonna yeah. win the. Win they that. have the most stored energy they're for gonna, sure. They're gonna win that, yeah. You know, and the muscular, you know, lean person is kind of screwed. So, I feel like I just sat through a Nat Geo episode. Yeah, yeah. the more you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Next question is from Mike Safai. What are your thoughts on using a belt to keep your waist small? I've always wondered if that is a form of muscle occlusion because I have seen belts so tight I imagine it does restrict blood flow. If that is the case, could it be possible to enhance the waist? This is uh, Arya's brother, yeah. man. This well, is uh, our boy right here. Can we just real quick do a quick mention on the genetics that family has? Have you seen their sister too? Yeah, they're all they're all they're Mike, all, Arya, and their sister. I, I forgot her name. They're all just name. ready to get on stage. They're all fucking shredded, and they're all really active. But they all seem to build muscle like it's like it's their job. They look all, they look, well. Let's be honest. I, in my opinion, from my experience and knowing a lot of the pros, Arya is. One of uh, one of the only all natural pros like that I that I know of. For so sure. genetically gifted. Yeah, I mean, to, just to be able to. Can hand, you imagine if he to, was on gear? Oh, right. I mean, just to get on stage like that. So this question's kind of funny in a couple of ways, right? So uh, I'm going to address the occlusion part right away. So you can't occlude uh, anything that's uh, in your. Um, your T-spine? trunk or, yeah your yeah. trunk or your chest or anything like that so it has to be a limb like the only way to occlude a muscle in order to get the benefits from like bfr would have to be a limb so it'd have to be your bias tries forearms so bias quads, and tr- hams, yeah, quads hams everything yeah. down like that so because it has a direct connection to the heart and blood so it's not, you ha- it's not yeah you have to you have to be able to occlude venous outflow which around the waist would be very difficult considering all how big the waist is and everything that's inside of it i mean <laughs> You could occlude it, but if you did, you'd fuck up you'd your... Die. Yeah, you'd die. Yeah, yeah, you'd die. If you actually could occlude it to actually to where it would actually build muscle, you would you'd die. So you'd occlude it to your yeah. organs. Yeah, yeah, so that wouldn't work. Occlude um, your liver. Now, does does <laughs> wearing the belt craze. actually make a small waist? Now, it can. And the reason it can is because if these knuckleheads wear these belts all the time in the gym while they're lifting weights... there's There are a ton of stabilizing muscles surrounding the core, the spine that you're now using this belt to do that instead. And so they're not being developed like they should be. They atrophy. Yeah, they atrophy. They shrink. They go to, which is why when you see waist trainers, things like that, why people can actually take measurements and show, hey, I lost an inch on my waist and absolutely prove that it does shrink your waist. The problem with you shrink the waist at the cost of, you know, totally weakening some of the most important muscles in your body. You're not talking about uh, weakening your calves or weakening your biceps or your forearms, which in my opinion are far less important. Your core muscles that so, and you know what, if you're fucking 20 years old, this may not matter so much to you, but I'll tell you what, being somebody who's trained tons of clients, the ones that are in their thirties, forties and fifties, this is where this is going to cause a huge problem. And it's going to be very interesting to see a lot of these bodybuilders, men's physique guys, that absolutely just neglect training their midsection in fear of getting it too big and bulky to create this V taper. Well, look. and then they compound the issue because you have now an atrophied core, <laughs> right? Yeah. And you're and building then big, strong, super massive, yeah, upper body, upper and lower body. So legs are strong, arms are strong, shoulders are strong, back, chest, <laughs> leg, weak core. <laughs> Holy cow. Now you're talking about, I've known. Be ready for corsets your whole life. Dude, I've known more than a few, uh, you know, bodybuilder type people who have hurt their back 
doing the most mundane shit. Yeah. Like stupid, like big muscular dude, you know, all the next thing you know, slipped a disc. How did you hurt your disc? I was doing curls or, you know, oh, I was throwing the Frisbee with my kid or something like that. It's like, what? You hurt your, like you, you, you squat 500 pounds and you hurt, you, you slipped a disc because you're That's where I really see, yep. like, <clears throat> I really hear it from like the throwing the Frisbee or picking up a shampoo bottle or gardening because yeah. they have no rotational strength, mm-hmm. right? Because they don't, mo- that's already a given. Most every bodybuilder trains in the sagittal plane, and which is, it. Yeah. which is understandable. It's your sport. You don't need to be able to move left or right really fast. So you don't need to train like an athlete, but here's where this stuff becomes really important is you keep building all this muscle on this weak ass core and you don't train any rotational strength. And then all it takes is the slightest movement where you're rotating yep. the spine like that, throwing a frisbee. And then you're compromised. Yeah. Then you're fucked and then you're hurt. And it's, and it's really weak that you get hurt doing something so weak as, yeah. you know, throwing a baseball or, or, or throwing something or turning just a little bit because you have no rotational strength. So I mean, do, does the the wearing the weight belt help keep the waist smaller? Sure, it can, absolutely it can. I what I think I, I, w- I, I wouldn't worry about getting a huge waist from muscle though. You know what I'm saying? Well, here's here's what like I so, mean. If bodybuilders, did you see my Insta their... story yesterday? I was I was I was poking at uh, uh, old Jeremy Bondia. Oh really? Yeah. So he he I finally he's got he just did a video of him like r- a real deadlift, not rack pulls, like deadlifting off the floor. Wow. So. Uh, really? Which is crazy. It's funny to watch because he's like super strong and like all these like isolated lifts. And then to see him like you probably never uh, deadlifts. Yeah, yeah. De- deadlifting yeah, three no, plates. You like, use your whole body. Right, right. So you know, and you see you're starting to see the men's physique guys starting to do it now. What's crazy is I remember when I really started deadlifting, it exploded my back. It mm-hmm. exp- like nothing. I, I had been rowing and lap pull down and dumbbells and bent over Just barbell row T bar. I've been yeah. doing everything for so long and had a pretty decent back and V taper already. When I started deadlifting, it gave a whole new level to my back, which jet all that did was make my waist look even smaller. So even any little bit of extra muscle you think you might build on your waist that's going to like take away from this V taper look. If you're the, the movement itself is going to create more of the illusion of you being bigger in your upper back anyways, that it, it's, it's negated. It's moot. And now I'm at least I'm doing something that save that actually is going to save, uh, save my core. Right. So I, I think it's a ridiculous idea that guys do. I think it's a fashion statement. Now I think it's become so popular, uh, to wear a belt and, uh, to brand it, put your name on it, do all that cool stuff, which is fine. That's, that's I have a belt, I still use my belt occasionally whenever I'm doing something where I think I might compromise uh, my back because I'm lifting a, a, a max rep or some shit. Uh, I might put it on there. Or if I'm just trying to test a new a new weight that I haven't done in a newfound range of motion. So I definitely think there's there's places for tools like this. I think that they've become an accessory, though. I think it's yeah. become... And you're not, you're not going to shrink your waist from wearing a belt when you wear it, when you just heavy deadlift or heavy squat. It, the way that some of these pros are using it is they'll put it on really tight for the whole workout. For everything that they do, they've got the belt on yeah. to keep the waist small. The entire time. They're Here's the, the thing. Like, if you're a bodybuilder and you're a pro bodybuilder and you're worried about growing your waist, like stop taking so much growth hormone and other shit. Like, that's going to make your waist. Like I'm pretty sure Phil Heath's belly didn't grow because he didn't wear a belt. Pretty sure that had more to do with oh God, the drugs and the food that he... That's a no-brainer right there. If you're taking HGH, like... That's going to explode your waist more than anything that could possibly explode yeah. your waist for sure. Absolutely. But as far as occlusion is concerned, occlusion <clears throat> is definitely uh, effective at building muscle. You just did. Muscle. A, you just did a recent Insta story on your occlusion. I did. I just started implementing it again, and every single time I do it, it's like instant. You know, I'll get an instant, almost quarter inch on my arms, like boom, right away. Very quickly. Now, going beyond that, I'll hit a limit. It's not like it just keeps growing or you know adding. But if I stay consistent with it, I can see the I can definitely see the benefit. Benefit, but it's quick. It's pretty fast. Like if you use occlusion right uh, on your limbs, you'll notice in a very short period of time, you know you'll get more muscle growth. And really, the way I, you know I've learned a lot more about how occlusion really builds muscle, and it's it's pretty interesting. You know, it's it's really it's working on the signal that waist buildup creates within muscle it has nothing to do with muscle damage and it's just it's just allowing all this waste buildup to happen it's very painful when you do it it burns and it sucks um, but it does build muscle and the good news is it doesn't cause a lot of muscle damage so 
you can add it to your routine without worrying about compromising your, your recovery too much. Mm. But yeah, putting a, a belt on your waist doesn't do that. Well, it has it has everything to do with the sarcoplasmic hypertrophy part of it, right? I mean, it's a, the excessive blood that's being rushed into this muscle belly. and I think it actually does everything. It's not just that. It's also muscle fiber growth because uh, the, because they're, they're trying to grow to accommodate to more for fluid. All, all, just to handle more uh, of this uh, of this waste uh, buildup that's starting to happen. Um, it's funny because the early studies on this were done a lot longer, a lot further back than I thought. I thought this was more of a recent thing. It's more recent in the sense that we're using it now um, in training and in physical therapy. Yeah, it goes all the way back to the 70s. I think it's, it's may, maybe even before. 60s. Yeah. Oh, 60s. In really? Japan. Oh, wow. In oh, Japan. you're right. You're right. In Japan, it was in the 60s. It made its way over here, like I think in the 70s. Yeah, it was said that the that the, <clears throat> the the guy who discovered it real, recognized that his calves grew when he would kneel for long periods of time because it, it naturally occluded his calves. And then he came up with this theory and tested it. So oh, it's, it's actually been studied. Oh, a long it it hundred percent. I remember the first time I did it. It it hundred percent works. You just can't. A uh, couple of things that I you know I tell people. One, it can't replace yeah. your, your strength training, your regular training on your calves. It's a great thing to do in addition to that to to maximize or volumize it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing is the people that uh, train less, like the Joe Donnellys or the Craig Capersos, will see the most results. I've seen. So if you're somebody who, and if you follow like a- Because they're already hammering that signal so Because much. they superset like, they're already, yeah. exactly, they're, they're already hitting something so close to what, what the benefits you're getting from occlusion. Those people tend to try occlusion and they don't think it's really working as much because they already train. So if you're already a, you know, superset, tri-set type of low rest, rest period guy and you are pump, 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 hard, hardcore till it burns all the time and you've been training this way for months all, on end- those people, they go try occlusion, and it doesn't seem to be a big difference. If you're somebody that's, it, I think it's a great time to do it after uh, or complement a strength uh, cycle or phase in my training. So when I'm doing heavy singles, doubles, or triples, or even running the fives, and throw it in. Yes, I love to throw it in to complement that phase of my training. When I'm in phase three of training, where I'm doing a lot of hypertrophy type stuff, anyways. I see the I see less benefits uh, mm-hmm. as I do when I'm when I'm confident. Have you that. messed around with it yet, Justin? Not yet. I've been really thinking about it too. Uh, I remember we had talked about that when you started doing it again, and um, yeah, I've been really curious to do it. I just haven't really been motivated yet. And well, uh, it's such an aesthetic thing, right? Yeah. That's well, that's why, why I'm asking because I'm wondering what's an the, aesthetic, aesthetic. It would probably have a significant impact. It might have a cause just because I, I don't. I dude, I the last time I really trained hard, like in the hypertrophy phase. Um, I mean, I swear it was like when I was working with you, you yeah. know, like, like that was like, I used to do it all the time in the gym and, um, you know, I loved it. I loved what it produced and what it felt like. I just like, I got away from it and I never got back to it. You're really. probably right. He would probably benefit the most. I think so. And, and, it, and I'm wondering, I'm speculating now, but I'm wondering if the performance benefits, uh, are, will center around cause you gotta, you gotta consider, right. If you're occluding on a semi-regular basis, like every week, right. You occlude your arms, your calves, mm-hmm. your quads, whatever is that will your body start to adapt by getting better at dealing with mm. that, that waste buildup. Mm-hmm. So maybe the performance benefits will be strength endurance, mm-hmm. you know, that burn, like you'll be able to fight off that burn longer. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah, wondering if that would be the case. Mm. Be interesting. Mm-hmm. That yeah, that and and rehab. That I might think be to somebody who's rehabbing knee or issues like that. I think well, we have fun. a guide. We have an occlusion guide. We don't talk about it a whole lot. It's really inexpensive, but we kind of break it down and teach you how to occlude properly. Right. Next question is from Kaisa. Why do female CrossFit athletes have thick waists? <sighs> Does CrossFit ruin a female physique? This is interesting. You know why I love this question? I like it too. I love this question because whenever you look at a sport and you look at the top performers of that sport, what you're looking at is a few different things. One of which is that that person was born to do well at that sport. Absolutely. So if I look at the top swimmers in the world, Mm -hmm. I look at the Olympics Somebody who doesn't understand this may look at that and be like, oh, wow. Like, wow, that's a really long torso. Yeah, swimming yeah. a lot gives you a long torso, short legs, you know, long arms, and a really flat, broad chest. It's like how people used to, like, um, yeah. Pilates and yoga and, and, and things like that used to make you lo- elongate your muscles yeah. by doing these. Uh, like ballerinas yeah. look like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. Like, or maybe, uh, or maybe that. <laughs> those girls do really well in those sports, is what it is. Yeah, I uh, think the CrossFit yeah. athletes, the female CrossFit athletes that do really well and compete at that level, they number one build muscle very easily, mm-hmm. and number two, 
a strong muscular waist, you better believe is going to help you perform uh, yeah. at a high level. Well, you're it's a snatches and cleans and like it's strength endurance, it's power. Yeah, I mean, talk about needing to stabilize and support your spine and like all the different external forces. It's like you need to have a nice, strong, you know, obliques and obliques in particular. Yeah, like and that, I think that's what they're probably identifying because like it's yeah. not you don't see that a lot, especially with females having like really like pronounced obliques, and when you do. It's impressive. It's like whoa, like right. you know, you can if you were in olive oil and you went into CrossFit, you would never get this massive squared up looking waist. It just it's you don't have the genetics to look that way. In the ones that are like Sal saying, the ones we're watching on TV and the ones that we know are good at CrossFit, it's because their their physiques were built to do CrossFit. That's yeah. it. That's yeah. the bottom line. Like on top of their training and all that other stuff. Yeah. I mean, it, of course, anybody who's, them. who's heavy snatching and cleaning and, and doing these overhead movements is you, it requires you to have a very strong, stable core. So yeah, you're going to get development there, but the ones that uh, tend to, to, to rise to the top that are excelling at this, they're not, they're not looking that way because they excelled. They are excelling because they are built that way. Mm-hmm. So think of it more like and, that. You know, here's the thing with the whole small waist thing. This is what I, one thing that I'd hate about the aesthetic uh, focused, uh, you know, physical. We can hear you crunching. Don't worry. <laughs> trying to hide his, <laughs> his mouth while he's crunching the ice over there. You going to hear that? Yeah. You're so Adam, polite. Adam consistently will eat something while we're trying to record it. So. <laughs> yes, dude. So the reason why, uh, one of the things I hate about these aesthetic, uh, you know, based, sp- uh, you know, physical sports like bodybuilding and bikini and stuff like that is they exaggerate signs that we normally find attractive. Now you have to ask yourself, why do we find a small waist attractive? It's not the small waist that we find attractive. It's the ratio of waist to hips in women and waist to, to shoulders in men. If there was a big ratio from waist to shoulders, it meant two things. A, they didn't store a lot of body fat, which meant they were probably active and whatever. And B, they had wide, strong shoulders. It did not mean they have a small waist. Does that make sense? If you take the average six-foot men in the world and you average them all out, their waists, and they're all lean, their waist sizes aren't going to have these dramatic changes. Where you'll see the big difference is going to be in their shoulders, how wide their shoulders are, how muscular sh- shoulders are. This is this is why we're attracted to small waists. It's not the waist; it's the it's the disparity. Same thing with a woman. When we think to ourselves like, "Ooh, a woman with a small waist is attractive," that's not true. A woman with a small waist and narrow hips is not attractive. It's the waist to hip ratio, and they've done many, many, many studies on this where they find. Women who are bigger, smaller, whatever. In fact, if you go back 50 years and you look at the the pinup girls or what what we what we considered back then the ideal, oh, yeah. it was about 30 pounds heavier, 20 to 30 pounds heavier than Very they are curvy. now. Yeah, they're much bigger waist, but they had the same hip to waist ratio that we see mm. today. So, mm. uh, so I want to get that out there because we're everybody's so afraid about their waist getting thick because they have muscle. Like if you're lean, don't even worry about that. And when you meet a woman in person who's lean and has a muscular waist. I've never seen a woman with a muscular lean waist that I thought to myself like, Ugh. like besides the steroided ones, right? I never look at it and go, oh, that looks unattractive. Always looks amazing because it shows their strength and their the fact that they've got some you know, some physical prowess with them. So. A lot of times, though, they're gonna they're not gonna have those pronounced hips. They're not. They're more of an athlete. They're built more more square. I mean, you when you look at the, a lot of the female CrossFit athletes, they don't have this sexy runway model or figure model like you're describing right now, where they have these. Tiny- they actually do have the narrow waist. Yeah, because it helps with running and jumping and all that stuff. Right, right. So yeah. they so they have they have this this narrow waist, but then they also have narrow. They have their their hips are square. They match, and that's that blocky. It makes it look even more. Yeah. It makes it look it makes it look more like that. If they actually had more hips to them, then they wouldn't look that way. Mm-hmm. They actually their waist size is actually pretty small mm-hmm. in comparison to. For the most part, if you develop really uh, muscular core muscles and you're lean, you're not overweight or whatever, you're not going to look worse. You're going to look a lot better. So just keep that in mind. Don't be afraid of training your core because that's one of my pet peeves when <clears throat> people are afraid of doing certain exercises because they don't want to. Do you know that a, a, in, yeah. in my experience too, a lot a lot of women that struggle with this kind of boxy or square hips look. Which this was Katrina's kind of thing. This was where she always kind of she, and she was a collegiate athlete, right? And so she always had these kind of square hips. And over the last three years, we spent a lot of time kind of like shaping a, a more developing the glutes more, right? Developing her glutes more, right, yeah, and also get, and getting her leaner, right? Yeah. So and all that's me just creating more of an illusion of these. 
bigger hips to a, a smaller waist. And she never pushed herself to a body fat percentage low enough to get rid of her, her stomach fat all the way through. So she's always had, I mean, she's always kept herself lean, but she's never been extreme lean. She's never had to push beyond to where her body had to use the body fat that she stored in her stomach, which we all tend to store a little bit more there than anywhere else. So once I took her to a point where she had leaned out beyond that, reduced all that body fat there, and then when we went back to incorporating more calories, I made sure that she was training glutes harder than she ever had before so that surplus of calories is now getting yeah. allocated. Brings to that contrast back. Yes, yeah. and so in, over time, and it's taken time, She's now. I've now created this more of an illusion that she has a smaller. To it's, it's funny too because it all points to all these things that we you know we tend to want the look or we find attractive. It all points to uh, better fertility. That's really what it all points to. Like yeah. uh, you know, women who store more in the lower body tend to have more favorable hormones and tend to store you know have or more fertile or likely to have successful childbirth. So it's all really fascinating, interesting stuff. I mean, I, I have a cousin in Sicily who this girl could gain 50 pounds, 60 pounds. It doesn't matter. All the body fat goes to her, her lower body and her boobs and her weight. Like she never stores. So she could be really big and she's got this really like pronounced hourglass type of shape. And, you know, she's always getting hit on, hit on by men and whatever because she gives off that illusion of being super fertile, you know, so it's interesting. So the next question is from JP889. In the new Intuitive Nutrition Guide, you talk about calorie undulation for weight loss. Can you use this for weight gain? You know, before you answer this question, Sal, just to, this reminds me um, something I'm trying to do right now. So if you guys aren't <laughs> following me on my Insta story, I'm trying to go through and I'm, uh, Organifi has a ton of like recipes for uh, all kinds of like desserts. I got to start, I got to start trying some of that Yeah, stuff. no, it's been, and Katrina and I, we've been trying to do- You did a, the keto cookies. I, I did another, and I did these peanut butter chocolate chip ones. So <laughs> I ate them before I did the recipe for <laughs> They were good. They were really good. So, oh, Bro, can you do me a favor? Because this would be great. You just have to go over to his house. I this think. would be, I was going to say, yeah. this would be great for our sponsor, Organifi, is if you made them and then had us eat them so we could all talk about them. <laughs> yeah, man. Yes, Instead of you eating all right? of them. Well, that's the goal is to get to that point. <laughs> but what I was going to say was if uh, those of you guys that are looking for kind of cool, healthier recipes or different stuff, I'm going to try and challenge myself to post more of that on my Insta story and share. I just, like I said, or Sal said, I just did the keto cookies. I, I showed a, a, and then I'll put the instructions on how to bake them and then all the, the breakdown of all of it. So if you're not... Uh, Follow me on the Insta story. Check that out. I'm going to start using more of the Organifi. The, the, what's great is the the green juice really, I would have never thought that it would taste good like in cookies and things like that, but it's got such a great flavor and it, that mint complements oh, any, yeah, any chocolate that. or peanut butter type stuff. So, I got to try it. Just yeah. So it, 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 it does, and same thing. And what I like about, because their, their protein powder is not my favorite tasting protein powder, but what I do notice is that when I make it in recipes where I, that calls for the protein powder and calls for the green juice, all of it combined, actually, it all they all tend to, tend to speak well together as far as the flavoring Have you, profile. But mm. ha, but you remember, it's plant-based. Compare it to other plant-based protein powders, which are all disgusting. Oh, yeah. It's way better. It's way better. Yeah, because whey comparing, proteins yes, usually taste good. Yes. So yeah. I'm comparing. I am comparing. So my all-time favorite tasting for baking uh, pro protein powder is uh, Optum Nutrition's whey protein. And until then... But it's also whey, and it's also yes, artificially flavored. Yes. Also. Yes. So... Uh, now that we have the Organifi sponsor, I've obviously started using a lot of theirs. I'll be straightforward, a normal shake. If you were to compare to the way and all you care about is flavor, it's, it's not better. It doesn't mm -hmm. taste, taste better, but for, uh, being that it, it has no way, has none of no artificial sweeteners in it. It's all purely uh, protein from plant. It tastes phenomenal in comparison, and it actually mixes really well in a lot of the food recipes. Yeah, I used to take, um, I used to use the raw protein from Garden of Life, I think it was, and it was tolerable, but it's nowhere near as good as the organic. Yeah, I see you wearing some of it on your shirt right now. I spilled it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the green juice. Yes. I'm such a, I did it, Justin. You will yeah, be, you, I was going to say, you're taking my thunder, dude. You will be shooting videos yeah, today. Captain so, Sloppy Eater over here. So the question was uh, about undulating calories for weight loss, because we talk about that in the uh, in the new nutrition guide, and then can you use that for weight gain? Absolutely. Definitely. We recommend that. Now, here's why 
we tell you to undulate your calories, whether you're trying to gain weight or lose weight. So let's start with weight loss. When you're at a calorie deficit, when you're eating less calories than your body's burning, your body aims to adapt to that by becoming more efficient, aka slowing itself down. And it does this through a different, a number of different ways that we've already identified through studies. One, it'll actually, uh, people will actually reduce their activity without realizing it. So your body will make you more tired or not make you want to move as much. The other ways are through your hormones. Hormones will start to change and, and modify and to get you to burn less calories. Your body will lose muscle to get you to burn less calories. So there's a lot of different things that can happen. <clears throat> and a lot of the ways you, you, you change that is through or you, you, you mitigate that is through exercise. So the right kind of training will, will make sure that your body prioritizes muscle and prioritizes this you know, optimum hormone profile because now your body says, okay, I need to be strong. So it's okay if we burn more calories. And the other thing you can do is not have the same calorie deficit every single day yeah. where I may have a deficit two days in a row, but then the third day I have a maintenance and the fourth day I have a slight surplus. Mm -hmm. And then the last three days I go deficit, deficit, deficit again. Giving, doing that to my body theoretically should uh, reduce the amount of metabolic adaptation that you get through being in lower calories. It should keep your body uh, you know, sensitive to protein. It should be more effective for basically for what your goals are. Now, when it comes to weight gain, the same is true. I just talked about this in a recent episode and uh, in our show notes to that episode, I believe it's episode, I want to say 624, we talk about how in a very short period of time, they showed insulin sensitivity being reduced within a, a week of being on a high calorie diet. So they had male athletes you know, eat 6,000 calories a day. So they went on this like super bulk and within a week, within a week, their yeah. body started becoming less sensitive to insulin. Now, you know, over the course of a long period of time, this can lead to things like diabetes, but in the short period of time, it means your body's going to be more likely to store body fat. And for anybody who's ever bulked up, uh, can tell you that when you go on a bulk, you gain muscle at first. And then mm -hmm. if you stay on it, you just, it just turns, it's just a bunch of body fat. You just gain a bunch of body fat. This may be one of the reasons why is that your, your body becomes less sensitive to insulin. Yeah. Your body starts to adapt, wants to gain body fat. When you undulate your calories for weight gain, you use the same strategy. So what you do is you go on like a big surplus on Monday, smaller surplus on Tuesday, maintenance on Wednesday, another surplus Thursday, deficit Friday. That might be a day that I fast. You know, Saturday, small surplus, Sunday maintenance. At the end of the week, I'm still in a surplus on average, so I know I'm going to gain but there's some days there that are maintenance or maybe even a deficit, and that keeps my body wanting to gain muscle, not necessarily storing body fat, and it keeps my hormone optimal. In my opinion, it's the only way to actually do a bulk without putting on a bunch of body fat. Otherwise, you you fall into the same trap that I see happening all, all over, especially with my peers, which is these aggressive bulks and aggressive cuts. Oh. And it's it's it was so obvious to me when I got on the circuit – when I would I would meet guys and I would see them show after show after show, and they really were kind of presenting the same physique every time. It was like, sure, they got better at their stage presence, sure, but it was like they followed the same protocol of dieting on off season, and then they had their on season, and it was like, and I bet it was even harder for them to get back even into that like condition. It, exactly, yeah. and each and what the they don't realize is their time. their body is becoming more efficient each time, so each time they're struggling to get to this, and they call it burnout. Yeah, they think they're burnout. They think it is the or they think it's the anabolics, and so they start ramping the anabolics yes, up. The anabolics go and up, yeah. in reality, is what it is is like you guys keep doing the same thing over and you're not to you're not going to get to this new level of physique until you learn how to bulk better because what you're doing is you go to bulk you add 20 pounds on and these are all arbitrary numbers but I'm just going to so the average person gets what, what's going on here you go through a bulk you add 20 pounds of the 20 pounds 10 of those pounds end up being muscle if you're lucky it's probably not even that but and then you go to a cut from the 20 pounds and because you've got to cut 20 pounds you're in a you're in a deficit for a long time probably 6 9 12 weeks at minimum and so you lose 
the you know 17 of those 20 pounds mm. and of the 10 pounds of muscle you build you probably also drop off four or five of those along the way because you're catabolic for such a long period of time and you're doing all this cardio like a lot of these knuckleheads do so you're telling the body it's not advantageous to have this extra muscle so they just get in this vicious cycle they bulk for 20 pounds and they cut 17 pounds off and they maybe add one to three pounds of muscle and it's the same one to three pounds of muscle every fucking show and that's why they present the same physique if you do this correctly and you actually do a lean clean bulk and you only let's say you only add now 12 pounds but 10 pounds or even let's say you don't get as much like because you're not always in a surplus you only get eight or nine pounds you get eight or nine pounds of muscle but you added 12 pounds now you only have to shred four pounds of fat so now when you drop down seven pounds you've got more muscle on your body and you're even leaner this time when you when you actually go through this cutting process and it's it's crazy how this is well, it was so obvious to me when when I'd start to see the same guys over and over each show because they don't change anymore. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. crazy. I, within a week, you, you know, you lose sensitivity. That's, that's, what that's they were, crazy to me. Yeah, they were, they they were already seeing the body. And you think about it, it, it makes, makes so sense. much sense. Yeah, I mean, like if I mean, why wouldn't you want to like restrict for a while? Like it just makes so much more sense to now resensitize, you know, your body and then also assimilate the food better and you're going to shuttle the nutrients more effectively. It feels like, you know, duh, you're going to, you're going to be able to build muscle more effectively. One of the best things you could do if you're bulking, uh, I I know I'm going to get people debating me on this, but one of the best things you could do when you're bulking is every once in a while throw fast in there. Throw a, a, you know, maybe once a week, throw a fast in there where you don't eat until two or three o'clock and you eat less calories. 100%. And yeah. make up for it on the other days. You can spread the rest out, you know, the, the calories that you miss, spread it on the other six days, which is not that bad. Um, and then see what happens. That little switch will resensitize you to insulin. You're more more sensitive to protein. I mean, I did this when I would go vegan every once in a while. I go vegan a day, you know, here and there, and I'd notice I would just do better in the gym, not because I went vegan, but because when I had a refeed, my body was, you know, using the protein more effectively. So uh, it's a very simple strategy. Plus, it it's it's a better strategy. Think about it this way: if you've ever dieted for a long period of time, or you've bulked for a long period of time, it gets fucking boring eating the same calories every single day. And even bulking can become a pain in the ass. Well, this is why I this is why I used to really enjoy carb cycling. Was for that exact reason right there. It was just it was just nice that I had different goals for each day. Like this could be this was going to be my really low day, and then I guess what? Then I get to have a really high day after that, and then I go back to like a moderate day. Like so, I really liked carb cycling because it created this this natural undulating um, pattern for me for calories. And uh, I loved I loved that because it gave me something different every day. Now, obviously, when I'm not competing, I don't follow a carb cycling. I do this naturally. I just kind of pay attention. Like you said, I, I, I base a lot off my daily movement. If I think that it's a day that I know I'm going to be sedentary, and I use football days for me as an example because I could literally sit around all day long on a Sunday and just watch football, those days are the days that I tend to try and incorporate my fasting. And it's funny because... Anybody who tries to pay attention to this will will real quick find out that the first few times you do this, it's fucking hard. Yeah, you're just sitting because there, you, right? You're watching TV. Yes, because you've already trained yourself the opposite. You don't. Most people don't realize that the natural habits that we've created for ourselves when it comes to eating and movement is typically we have an easier time skipping uh-huh. meals when we're busy and we're going all day long from one meeting to the next meeting and running around like crazy and burning a ton of calories. Well, those are the times that we have an easier time skipping meals. And then the times when we do nothing, we sit at a desk all day long or we sit and watch TV, those are the days that we tend to make these bad choices or we overconsume, which in my opinion, it couldn't be worse to do that. Just flip-flopping it makes a huge difference. I take it a step further too when I'm coaching someone towards intuitive eating is I have them undulate their macros too. So some days, kind of like carb cycling. That's what carbs are. Yeah, it's very similar to that, but I'll undulate everything, proteins uh, as well, you know, fats, carbs, I'll do the whole thing. Just to get, you know, plus you start to figure your body out, see what works, how you respond to different calorie intakes, how you respond to different macros. It's just a smarter way of approaching whatever goal you have uh, in mind. Check this out. Go to YouTube, subscribe to Mind Pump TV. Adam has a surprise for you. Go check it out right now. Also, if you go to mindpumpmedia.com, you can get 30 days of coaching from Mind Pump for free. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. 
The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.